Hello. On this edition of MTA Commuter Connections, we'll talk with MTA Administrator Robert Smith, the top person in Maryland Transit, about a number of exciting plans and projects ahead for Maryland Transit commuters. We've got an update on the red and purple line transit projects, and MTA is geared up and ready to get you to Orioles baseball this season. We've got the game plan, and we'll answer your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment right here. I'm Paulette Ostridge. Welcome to MTA Commuter Connections. When you say MTA for many, local bus, light rail, metro, and mobility paratransit services in the Baltimore region come to mind. But MTA service and reach runs far beyond the immediate Baltimore area to various points throughout the state. Examples of this are Mark Train, which provides daily service between West Virginia, Maryland, and Washington, D.C., and MTA Commuter Bus, which is also a statewide service. Keeping the trains and buses moving reliably for customers is a huge responsibility, one that MTA Administrator Robert Smith assumes daily. Mr. Smith joins us today to talk about a number of exciting plans in the works for transit in Maryland. Hello, Robert. Good morning, Paulette. How are you? Good. Good. Nice to see you. Um, I believe we're approaching a very special anniversary. Um, you'll be at the MTA a year, I It'll think, be, in yes. May. Yes. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Uh, your background in transit is, is quite impressive. Um, your wealth of experience includes stints in both Chicago and Dallas? Correct. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your experience in transportation? Well, you know, I've been, Paulette, in transit a lot of years, and I've seen a lot of different locations, and I'm particularly proud to be here uh, in Maryland again for the second time. But I've worked in Chicago, I've worked in Dallas, uh, in different parts of the country, and at the end of the day, uh, we're all uh, focused on the same thing, which is providing safe, reliable transportation solutions for the regions that they're in. For those who may not know, what is the strategic group mission of the MTA? Let me say that um, we believe that the Baltimore region, uh, the state of Maryland, has a lot of great opportunities. The state is growing. Uh, and the, the strategic goal is to increase ridership. Our strategic goal also is to provide efficient and safe transportation and be a part of a region that's growing and dynamic, and the Baltimore region is one. And as you mentioned earlier, we also have a statewide role where we're working with locally operated transit systems throughout the state to do that very same thing in those particular areas. What's the governor's vision and, and what's your vision for the MTA? They're very much aligned. The governor would like to see us double ridership, the governor would like to see us have a more, be a part of making Maryland a lot greener and cleaner mm. in terms of efficient fuels. So we're about the business of, in the state of Maryland, how can we help with congestion, one. And two, how can we do it in a way that helps create jobs, uh, whether it's uh, reducing uh, uh, congestion on our roads, whether it's creating jobs with our projects, and at the end of the day, doing that in a way that helps make the state and the Baltimore region and the Washington DC region for that matter, a much more viable um, a community that's livable and that we can grow with them. That's a great vision. Um, as part of your vision and the governor's vision for transit, there's a new transit modernization program um, for the bus system called BNIP that's being launched mm -hmm. soon. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about BNIP and, and how it will affect bus service in the region? We're really proud of our programs. Uh, our transit modernization plan is how can we make the MTA much better? Uh, our transit modernization plan deals with uh, capital programs, whether it's building uh, new rail facilities, buying new rail cars, buying and replacing our aging infrastructure of buses and the like. But before we could do any of that, we've got to take care of our core service. And in the Baltimore region, our bus network improvement project is taking care of our bus service, which is 60 plus percent of all of our ridership. So in order for us to do that, we need to take care of first things first. This bus network improvement project, uh, we started last fall, actually last September. And it's a nine month program that allows us to, for the first time in over a decade, uh, take a look at our alignments, make sure we're going where our passengers want to go, that they're aligned with jobs, one, that they're able to get to life supportive services such as medical activities and shopping, and also in alignment with the growth uh, with Baltimore City. 
as the city grows, where's, where do people live? Where do they work? And I think we've got to be a part of growing with that particular region. Absolutely. Um, how long has it been since the last comprehensive bus overview or, or review? Well, let me say we should do these uh, from an industry standpoint every five or six years. It's been over a decade since our last one. And uh, a lot has changed. A lot continues to change. And as an agency, we've got to stay uh, on top of changes in the region through, uh, throughout the state and also in the industry. So it, it's been over a decade. It's long uh, overdue. And we look forward to uh, continuing to uh, 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 make our system more efficient and effective. What will um, transit patrons notice about their bus service after the changes have taken place? You know, initially, these changes will take place over a five-year period. Uh, we we want to be realistic about what we're doing. Initially, what we'll see is that we want to make our service more reliable, which means they need to be on time. I won't get into the technical terms, but effectively, what can we do structurally to ensure that we have the right vehicle, the right uh, schedule, to where uh, we show up to pick a passenger up when we say we would do that. So on time will be the first thing that we're doing. We're going to pair that up also with the new technology that we tend to um, put on our buses and trains over the coming months that can help the passenger know when the vehicle is coming through next vehicle arrival uh, uh, and a, lot of, a few other things that we're working through. So over the next five years, you'll see a lot of changes beginning in August of 2014. That's great. I love next vehicle arrival. That's fantastic. Um, when are the, the bus changes scheduled to begin? We're going to start in August. Um, that We have opportunities two to three times a year that we make changes to our bus system, our light rail, and our metro system. We'll start that then. And as I said, over the next five years, we'll implement changes that is not something we simply went into uh, a conference room and developed, but we it's interactive. Uh, we've worked with our riding public. We've worked with our employees, um, other stakeholders in the region. So what we're doing is a collection of ideas from all of us uh, in the Baltimore region that want to see a better system. Oh, that's wonderful. You really reached out to everybody. Um, Mark Weekend Service began earlier this year, and it's been extremely well received. Talk a little bit about that. The Mark Weekend Service is part of our transit modernization plan. Uh, there's a lot of things we're doing around the state. Um, it's actually been on the books for some time, and it's something that was very much requested by our passengers. It started in December, and it's more of a success than we initially thought. In fact, our ridership um, in February and March is well over 6,000 passengers, um, and we expect that to continue to grow. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. It was very exciting hearing thank about you. all the projects coming up and uh, the exciting MTA. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Coming up next, we have an update on the red and purple line transit projects. Stay with us. As you've heard, Maryland has two exciting rail projects being planned for the Baltimore and Washington regions. Both are expected to improve mobility and connectivity in the state and bring important business, employment, and training opportunities to both regions. Joining us with an update on the red and purple line projects is MTA Executive Director for Transit Development and Delivery, Henry Kay. How are you, Henry? I'm well, thanks. Very nice to see you. Good to see you. You're a very busy man, so I'm very grateful that you're here. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, Tell us, just for those that may not know, what is the red line? Where does it go, and what purpose does well, it serve? Well, the red line is, you know, for folks who don't know, um, a really exciting sort of once-in-a-generation opportunity for, for transit in the Baltimore region. It is the next major expansion of our rail system, so building on the metro subway, the light rail. Uh, the red line is a brand new east-west light rail line. It'll go right through the heart of the region, uh, from Woodlawn, along the Edmondson Avenue corridor, through downtown through Fells Point, Harbor East, uh, to Canton, Highlandtown, Greektown, and then finally ending at Bayview Hospital. So 14 miles of brand new light rail service for the region. Wow, that's fantastic and greatly needed. And um, silly question, but what purpose does it serve? Well, the, the thing that we have 
a good start uh, on a rail system in the Baltimore region. I mean, based on prior investments, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who ride rail transit today, and we have bus services that connect to those lines. But what we've really been lacking and that MTA started to focus on more than a decade ago is trying to build out more of a regional rail system. So we look down the road into to our neighbors in the Washington region, and they've got a you know fully built out system. You can connect sure. from one rail line to another and get almost everywhere you want to go. And so what we'd like to see happen in the Baltimore region is you know some very strategic investments and additions to the Baltimore region rail system so that we can create that kind of system connectivity too. So the important thing about the red line is that it does go east-west across the city, so it provides you know wonderfully enhanced transit, public transit in that corridor. But what it also does is it connects directly to the rest of the existing system. So whether it's MARC or light rail or metro, you'll be able to connect directly from a red line station to one of those stations. So suddenly, you know, you have an opportunity to ride rail to a station, you know, just make a quick transfer, get on um, a different rail line, and ride to your final destination. So we'll have much more of a system than we've had previously. Oh, well, finally, I can't wait. Um, but speaking of DC, what about your project in, in the Washington area, the Purple Line? Well, the Red Line has a sister project, as you mentioned, the Purple Line. You know, in the transit uh, planning business, we like to call, you know, give lines color names. I think it helps mm -hmm. give them an identity and helps people understand them. Um, so our, our project in the uh, in uh, in the Washington region, Montgomery and Prince George's County, is called the Purple Line. It's also a light rail line. Uh, it's 16 miles long. Um, it goes from New Carrollton in Prince George's County through College Park, through Silver Spring, and then ends in Bethesda in Montgomery County. Well, that's great. Um, you recently got some great news about federal funding. We did. Uh, both those projects, the Red Line and the Purple Line, are um, depend on a sort of complex uh, variety of funding sources. The state is paying a part of them, um, but we're also expecting a federal investment in each of those two projects. That's really what makes the financial plans for each of those two projects possible. And luckily for us, um, the Federal Transit Administration has a program. It goes by the name New Starts, because, and it's intended to fund projects like this across the country. So we've watched you know, some of our uh, competitor regions across the country get New Starts grants so they can expand their rail system. And we've waited for years for, for, for the Baltimore region, for the Washington region, to be able to be in a position where we've had projects ready uh, and able to compete for funding under that program. So uh, we got great news. Uh, uh, the President's fiscal federal fiscal 15 budget, which is, just came out um, in March, um, had in it uh, the recommendation that each of those two projects, the Red Line and the Purple Line, receive $900 million each. Yeah. So a very significant federal uh, investment um, that really does make the financial plans for them possible. So it was wonderful news, long awaited. Um, it came about as a result of you know, investments the state has made, uh, an MTA has made to be able to get the projects ready, um, and also very strong support from our um, congressional delegation. Uh, they had to really um, go to the mat uh, for these projects. Wow, well that's great, congratulations. Thank you, it was good news, good news for all of us. Terrific news. Um, you talked about the transportation benefits, what about the economic benefits of these projects? Yeah, when we think about projects like Red Line or Purple Line, or really any of the services that MTA offers, you know, we, we focus first on the transportation benefits, how many people will they carry and where and how quickly and how reliably. But they also have very important economic benefits too. Um, I mean, they really, you know, fundamentally they allow people to get to school, to work, um, to the places they need to go to support themselves. And so when we think about expanding those networks, we ask ourselves that question, you know, how well will they serve that purpose? And, you know, we've concluded that for both Red Line and Purple Line, they have very significant economic benefits for the regions they're in, for the state as a whole. Um, their benefits come in the form of enhanced mobility for people. They need to get to the places they want to go. Right. They spend less time doing it. Sure. That means they have more time uh, for their families, more time at their jobs, more time for um, having fun, uh, which is always important uh, for everybody's quality of life. Um, but they're also, uh, the projects themselves create jobs. Uh, mm -hmm. Between the two of them, there'll be about 9,000 person years of work uh, to build them. Yeah. And so that comes mostly during the five and six year period of time in which the projects are built. So there are jobs associated with them. And then in the long term, there are also um, uh, development opportunities around the station. So each project includes many new stations you know, in its respective region. And most of those stations create opportunities for new development at that place. So because they bring better access to that place, they bring a, a focus and attention to that mm -hmm. place, um, they create opportunities that developers respond to. And so we might expect to see uh, uh, you know, new developments uh, at places like West Baltimore uh, yeah. in the Washington region, uh, near our Poppleton Station, which is adjacent to the University of Maryland Biopark, right. um, in the county, in the Woodlawn area on Security Boulevard. You know, there are several stations that create new development opportunities. So those kinds of economic benefits will pay off uh, for many years to come. Wow. 
Well, this is sparking a lot of great things for a lot of people. Um, could you talk a little more about the opportunity for local jobs? Yeah, the, the, you know, when a product like this comes along, I mean, a very significant amount of local money goes into it. As I mentioned, um, you know, it's a funding plan that does include state money. It does include some county money as well. Um, and so, you know, I think most people have a reasonable expectation that those job opportunities are going to uh, be available locally. And so the projects include some initiatives that MTA has developed um, that are designed to um, create opportunities for people to get those jobs. So, for example, we've kicked off something we call preferred training partners. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've asked for proposals from training organizations around the regions. Those can be nonprofit organizations, community colleges that are in the business of training people for jobs. And we've told them that, you know, we have jobs, um, we, have, we have training that needs to be done, um, and we've asked them to submit proposals to us so that they can be selected as a preferred partner. They then get some funding from the State Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation. They run people through a training process, and then when the jobs are actually available, when these projects go to construction, um, those folks are ready to go, and they're trained and they're ready. So we connect to local people because these are organizations that work in local communities, they train people locally, um, and so the chances that someone can connect with that organization, get the right training, and then get in the job is, is maximized. Well, that's fantastic. Well, one last question real quick. When do, does construction start and when will it be finished? Well, it's about the same for both projects. We would expect to be under construction in some form. We sort of start small and then it gets big mm -hmm. after that. Um, in 2015, so as soon mm -hmm. as next year, you could start wow. to see shovels in the ground on both projects. Um, Red Line, because it involves a very substantial tunnel through downtown Baltimore, will take a bit longer to build. It should be open in 2022. Uh, the Purple Line doesn't include a tunnel. It's a little longer, but the, the construction should go more quickly. So it should be open in late 2020. Well, thank you, Henry. Thanks so much. It was great seeing you. Coming up next, baseball is back. But what's your plan for getting to Oriole Park for all of the season's action? MTA has a winning, hassle-free game plan for getting you there. That's next. After a pretty challenging winter, it's refreshing to know that spring is finally here and that one of America's favorite pastimes, baseball, is not far behind. Oriole fans are looking forward to a winning season and MTA is geared up to get you to Oriole Park for all of the season's action with several transit options. MTA Director of Rail Services, Jason Lurz, joins us with all the details. Hello, Jason. How you doing? Good to see you. Are you as happy that I am that baseball season is almost here? Uh, more to the point that it uh, kind of signals that uh, the winter's over. Yes. So uh, after the season that we've had with the snow, uh, yes, uh, baseball season is welcome in Baltimore. Thank goodness. How do you think the O's will do this season? Uh, this season, I mean, 2012, I mean, that was, uh, that was a season, that was a rush season, uh, a nail-biter down to the end. Yes. Uh, um, 2013, it seems like they kind of got stuck in a rut that they uh, couldn't climb out of. So. Uh, um, the, this new season, this, uh, this new 2014 season, I guess is the 60th, uh, 60th anniversary of uh, Orioles. Mm. Um, uh, I believe their lineup, uh, they've uh, waited out uh, some of the trades uh, this, this fall and the spring, and uh, I think they got a, a good lineup. So it should be very entertaining this year. Yes. Do you plan on attending any games at Oriole Park? Oh yes, uh, my daughter and I, we, uh, we, we attend uh, two or three games a, a year. Um, I wanted to, to kind of bring her into um, the kind of feeling, the, the ballpark feeling that my father uh, afforded me the opportunity to. So uh, the smells, the warm summer uh, breezes, the, uh, the hot dogs and peanuts, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's part of uh, a, um, a ball game and uh, I don't think any kid should go without. Oh, no. She'll remember that for a lifetime, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, what's the best way to Oriole Park on game day? Um, the MTA offers uh, several uh, transit options that uh, uh, can be uh, utilized by our, our patronage and the uh, ballpark fans. Um, uh, mainly, we, we recommend that uh, uh, the patrons and the, the, the O's fans utilize light rail. Um, as, as luck would have it, we happen to have a light rail station right outside mm. the ballpark. <laughs> so uh, how fortuitous. So the, uh, the, the patrons can uh, hop on uh, from our north and southern uh, stations um, and exit at, at Camden Yards and uh, enjoy a game free of uh, the, the traffic and, and normal city snarls that kind of might uh, hamper their experience. 
Yeah. How, how much will it cost to ride light rail on to the um, uh, The light rail, uh, uh, it's 160 for a single trip, uh, but we recommend taking uh, uh, the, the all-day pass, which is about 350 It uh, will um, make the, uh, uh, the, the migration to the event easy. That way you're not fumbling around at the uh, ticket vending machines at the end of the game. It just makes the process more, uh, or more operate more smoothly. Yeah, absolutely. How frequent do the trains run on, on game day? Well, that really depends. That depends on whether or not it's an early day or an evening game, it's a weekday or it's a weekend game. Um, a lot of our schedules are, are set. Um, however, due um, to these games, we do realize that it's going to uh, um, involve uh, higher ridership. So we do accommodate our, um, the service um, to accommodate the, uh, the increased traffic due to the ball game. So on average, uh, it's about 10 to 15 minute uh, wait time at stations. Um, the closer you are to the, sta uh, the stadium, the shorter the wait time because you're in, a, in the city. Sure. 10 to 15 minutes, that's not bad. No. Um, what's one of the other options for, for getting to Oriole Park on game day? Um, obviously, uh, as, as light rail is the key, there um, are metro and bus. Uh, metro, um, little unknown fact about Baltimore City, yes, we have a subway system. Um, uh, it uh, it's runs, uh, can drop you off at Charles Center Station. Uh, it's just a short walk um, to uh, Camden uh, Yards or Lexington. Um, once you get off at Lexington, you look, you, you get to the street. Uh, Lexington in Utah, and you just look down the street, you can see the, uh, the opening gates to, to Camden Yards. Nice little walk, um, and there's bus service that runs frequently down there. So, But the Metro line runs from Owings Mills to Johns Hopkins, and uh, it has uh, headways uh, or, or station uh, times of 8 to 10 uh, minutes. And what's the cost to ride Metro to the It's the park? same. It's $1.60 for a single trip and three fifty for an all-day pass. And how frequently do those trains run? Oh, 8 to, eight to 15 or 8 to 10 minutes. It depends, so, but uh, for game day, um, they'll run 8 to 10 minutes. Now, fans also have another option to go by MTA local bus. Um, do you know what some of the lines are that go to? Yes, uh, um, because the stadium is a uh, high priority, um, we need to get uh, the fans to the games and away from the games as expeditiously as possible. Um, I believe there's 19 or 20 bus lines that frequent the, the area. Wow. So. Wow. Um, I can't rattle off all of them. I, I know there, there's quick bus and there's normal bus routes, but uh, our patrons can go to the MTA website to uh, get more information yeah. on those. MTA.maryland.gov. And the fare for the bus? It's the same. Uh, all MTA service uh, or normal route service is uh, 160 one way and 350 for an all-day pass. Terrific. Well, thank you, Jason. Yep, thank you. Go O's. <laughs> Good to see you. You too. Next, we'll answer your customer questions and concerns in our Ask the MTA segment. Stay with us. Welcome back. MTA Customer Information Officer Marisol Peralta joins us to respond to a few MTA customer questions and concerns. Hello, Marisol. Hello. How are you? Good, thanks. Good. What questions do you have for us today? Today I have four very good questions from our customers. And the first question is, Why are these teenagers allowed to run up the escalators and stop it before us older folk can walk up it nice and healthy? It is dangerous to run on the Metro's escalators. If we see young people running on the escalators, please let the attendant know at the station. Okay, I had no problems with the service. I just wanted to know if they could add more buses to line 77 and 54. Yes, that is possible. The MTA could add additional service on the 77 and the 54 bus line, but we would have to monitor the line and see at what time the service is needed. My question is, I ride the subway a lot, and uh, it's always nice to know when the next train's going to be coming. So it'd be nice if MTA did something where they, uh, you could see the next arrival time of the next train. Yes, that is possible, and that is something that the MTA is presently working on. Would it be possible to have better signage on the area where the service is disrupted on the light rail? Yes, the MTA recognizes this is a problem and we're working on better signage at the light rail stations. If you have a question you would like the MTA to answer, please look us up on Facebook, Twitter, or the MTA website. Well, thank you, Marisol. It's great having You're you welcome. here. 
That brings us to the end of another Commuter Connections program. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. Take care.